welcome friends to this local event here just prior to our regular meditation workshop in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. And we are having these meetings. We thought that these are small meetings for local people, but I find the locality has increased in size. And now it extends to uh, not only Wisconsin, but Minnesota also. So anyway, I'm very happy that you were able to make it all the way to this place for attending one of these local meetings. The idea of having these meetings is to remind our minds not to forget our priorities in life. If we don't meet, our mind gets so strayed away and floats into all other activities and distractions. But by meeting regularly, we get a reminder that do not lose your priorities in life. What we are doing for a living here, what we are doing to support our families, what we are doing in relationships here, they are all very temporary. None of them last forever. At the time of death, everything goes away. And a person, almost every person, regrets on the day of death. Oh, I could have done that. Oh, I wish I had done that. And now there is no time. I can't complete any of the tasks I wanted to complete. I cannot say goodbye to that person I wanted to say. I cannot finish that project I taken. I just kept on postponing it. All the things left unfinished remain unfinished because no time is granted after the time of death to complete those things. And then why regret at that time when we should recall and remember even earlier that one day every one of us has to leave our bodies here and go away. There is no exception to the rule. Great masters have come, prophets have come, those who were called sons of God have come, they all died, nobody is here anymore. How do we imagine that we will stay here forever? Nobody stays here forever. Therefore, if you look at life in the context of total time, in the context of the birth of this planet, which is four and a half billion years ago, in the context of the birth of this universe, which scientists say is 14 and a half billion years ago, what is life of 100 years? It's such a small speck. I saw a clock in the National Geographic office in Washington, D.C., showing the clock of creation, that this world was created at 12 o'clock. And at 12, there was nothing existing, zero. At 12, the stroke of 12, we don't know if it's 12, midnight or 12, noon, I suppose it was midnight. It's all dark. So at 12 midnight, the clock struck and the big band took place and this whole universe came into being. Out of that nothingness flew out time, space, gravity, all the laws of nature. They flew out of that zero space, zero time. From that big bang, the whole universe was created. And as the clock moved, those gases of hydrogen began to turn into helium, and from helium into other metals. And in 14 and a half billion years, they have produced more than 190 basic elements of the periodic table. And they kept on growing. They, the add, adding of elements slowed down. Today, the elements are being added very slowly. It takes a few million years to add one element. So in the several next billion years, more elements will be added to the periodic table. In this clock, the clock was striking one. And there were no planets. There were hardly any stars. Gravity was working its way to convert energy into matter. And by gravity's pull, put them together. And stars were born. Gradually, different galaxies were born to house the stars. And they all roamed around in circles by the power of gravity. 
at 2 o'clock, there were still no planets that we could see. At 3 o'clock, some kind of planetary systems began to appear in different galaxies. And at 4 o'clock, we found a system that we call our own solar system. And at 5 o'clock, the Earth was born. And at 5.25, man was born. And today we are at 5.30. Can you imagine the advent of man on this clock was so late? And now in this time frame, what is our life? In not even one second. It's not even a nanosecond of our life. It's like a bubble. And you see on the ocean side, you go to the bank of the ocean and see the waves coming. A wave comes, rises, looks like a great wave of water and just disappears, goes away. Our life is no different than that. It's like a wave arising from the ocean and just sinks the same way. In terms of total time that's existing around us, in terms of the infinite space that is existing around us, our life is a very, very short period. And that we have this small opportunity, it's like a window that we have into opening something that goes beyond this universe. It's a window, very small window, that opens up for us so that we can escape from a prison house. We don't realize that we are all prisoners. We are prisoners bound by several walls of prisons. It's not one wall. It's a very difficult prison to get out of. If you break one wall, you get a, a, another one. You break that one, there's another bigger wall. There's wall after wall surrounding this big prison in which we are imprisoned. The one pr uh, prison that is around us are called shackles. You know, when dangerous prisoners are captured by the governments and put in prison, they shackle them. They put irons around their feet so they can't move. They put uh, uh, handcuffs, they tie them up. Depending upon how restless the prisoners are, they really tie them up. Have you ever realized that the body we are wearing, the physical body, is no more than shackles? Do you know this body is preventing us from flying? This body is preventing us from going anywhere outside the prison? This body is such a big prison? And you are thinking, what a great thing we have to be a human body, stand in front of a mirror and try to do new makeup and find a new hairstyle and find new clothes to house this body, which is a prison itself. It's worse than a prison, it's a shackle. If you are able to fly free from this prison, you would find what a big shackle it was around us. That this body was not a big help to us. The body was a very big obstruction to freedom. That we have lost our freedom because we have a human body. And yet we are so proud of our bodies and have begun to identify with it. Imagine a prisoner who would say, I love my handcuffs. I want to paint them. I, I like red handcuffs. I got my shackles on my feet. I want to beautify. I'll paint my nails and I'll paint my shackles on my feet to look pretty. Mm -hmm. This is our state, that we are using a body that is a shackle, that is a prison around us. That's not allowing us freedom. We are trying to take greater care of that. <coughs> And worse than that, we are trying to greater care of things that are around this body. They are not even animate things. They don't speak. We talk of cars and houses and property and furniture. And we spend so much time on them. We think of buying the best furniture. We go around shopping for these things. Those things are only created outside the body to support the body. They have no other function. When the body dies, none of that matters whatsoever. No matter how expensive your sofa was, no matter how big your car was, no matter how big a mansion you lived in, nothing matters. They were all meant for the body and the body is gone. And body is gone like a bubble. It rose like a bubble and disappeared like a bubble. Everything else was left behind in time. <clears throat> Billions of years of time absorbed everything that you had. And you withdraw your attention, withdraws from the body and discovers, why did I waste my time? 
what was the purpose of life? Why did I become human just to gather things which don't go with me? Just to spend my time in the company of things that were unreal, disappeared because I died in my body? Did I not miss out something? Was that the very purpose? Therefore, these great explorers of things beyond the body have come and told us. The great mystics, masters, prophets, sages, yogis, they have come and told us that the body is not yourself. It's merely a cover upon yourself. You are imprisoned in the body. Release yourself. Release while you can that there is a window open through which you can escape even now. <clears throat> there is a window open within the body. While you are in the prison, there is only one window open, but nobody can see it because the eyes we see with are located outside the body and we can only see things outside the body. Therefore, we cannot see where the window is. The window is not outside the body, nor is it upon the body. It's inside the body. Since the window of escape is inside the body, nobody can see it. These mystics come and tell us that there is a real window into which you can fly out and at least experience what your reality is, experience where you would go when the body is no longer there. Why don't you at least try it out? If you don't believe that there is a window, it's all right. You don't have to believe it. If you don't believe that there is water in this cup, you don't have to believe it. But if you drink it, it is there. You experience it, it is there. So the mystics say it's not a matter of believing. All religions are based upon belief. Spirituality is not based on belief. Religions have departed from spirituality basically in this way that they depend on belief systems whereas spirituality depends upon experience. Spirituality it does not depend on believing there is a cup of water lying somewhere. Spirituality believes go and taste it and then say there was water there. Big difference. There is nobody stopping us from trying to find that truth. There is nobody telling us, don't go and check out if there is a window inside or not. Who is stopping us? Nobody has ever told us in life, don't go and look for the window. <clears throat> then who is stopping us? If you come to think of it, it's only your thinking mind that is stopping you. Nobody else. Your own mind stops you. Your own mind has developed an empire of its own. The mind that was given to us as a wonderful slave, a servant, to work for us so that we can think with it, so that we can read with it, we can talk with it, we can do thousands of things, we can manifest universes with our mind, we can connect to the universal mind and see the whole of the universe through it. This beautiful mind that was given to us, this wonderful machine that was given to us, by its own functions, by going through the sense perceptions outside, and by developing relationships, possessions, contacts outside, developed his own empire and does not want to lose its empire. When you tell yourself, which means you tell your mind, I want to see, that man say there is a window inside us. I want to go and see the window. The mind says, forget it, all the windows are outside. Here you've got so many windows on your body through which you are looking out, your eyes are your best windows, the windows of the soul and the mind and everything in you. There are so many other windows on your body and they are very pleasurable, ears to hear music. And then there are uh, other windows, nose to smell fragrances, the door refers to have sex and enjoy other activities of uh, relationships. There are so many windows attached which more take you outside of your body. Have a good time, that's what you are here for. The mind does not let you go to the window that lies inside you. And that is why mystics have to repeatedly come and tell us that your high priority in life is when you can discover a window, please do so. And that is only possible during this very, very short experience of a bubble called human life in which you can discover that window. Don't miss it. If you happen to be in any other life form, 
if you happen to be a tree or a plant, like outside, you see those trees and plants, they all have life, they all have growth, they all have souls. You'll be amazed to discover they are the same kind of souls you have. The soul is no different, the minds are different, the bodies are different, the forms are different, but the soul that makes them alive is the same. And yet, they cannot find a window. There are birds flying outside, there are animals flying outside, there are angels flying in heaven. They cannot find the window. Here we have one unique example out of all the 8.4 million types of species of life forms. They have been recorded in some old Indian Vedic traditions that there are 8.4 million types of species. And the highest species, based upon the predominant elements in them, are only 400,000 out of the 8.4 million. The 400,000 species includes all the angels, all the gods, all the higher entities that govern different realms, plus human being. Human being is just one of them, or one of the 400,000. That there should be one form of life out of 8.4 million species of life, and that the only form in which a window can be discovered inside that form is a very unique situation. We have explored this, that there is no other form in which you have the window open. And therefore, by frequent meetings like this, all we are doing is to keep on reminding us, don't forget the inner window, just by trying to constantly utilize your outer windows and constantly getting distracted by those windows into the mind's empire. Don't accept the mind's advice because the mind will always say, oh, so much important thing that I have around me. Because the mind has set up an empire. It does not want to lose that empire. Therefore, the mind will constantly tell you to go and take care of things. After all, I'm a human being. I have to take care of my bills. I have to take care of my job. I have to take care of my family. I have to take care of all those things. Aren't they important? They are very, very important for the mind. Absolutely unimportant for the soul. <coughs> but we forget about the soul. We identify ourselves completely with the mind. We think the mind is us. And therefore, all the interests of the mind are our interest, and that's where we should spend our whole life, and we are doing it. It's amazing that the window remains closed inside us, an escape from the very prison, from the series of prisons. This body being the first prison, which is like shackles upon, the, upon us, the attachments of the world being another prison that will never let us go out, the whole physical experience being a big prison for us. The law of karma that permeates the three worlds of this creation is the biggest prison of all. The law of karma is so relentlessly applicable in these three worlds. Nobody can escape it. Great masters came. People with great realization, people who had crossed in the window into higher realms while they were in the body, they were subject to the law of karma. And all that karma said was that to every action, there's a reaction. That whatever you do, you sow the results of it. You do a good deed, you will get a reward for it. You do a bad deed, you'll be punished for it. And who will determine what is good or what is bad? You will determine. Nobody else. If you can't determine, judicial systems will exist around you, created by you, who will determine that for you. So what a trap. What a trap. Karma is the greatest trap. In the Indian lore, in the Indian mythology, they talk of uh, Lord Krishna, an avatar, one who had knowledge and realization of the truth and reality beyond this physical reality. Even when he was a young child, they said that he had knowledge. He had his, he was a little cowherd. That means he looked after cows of the village. He took the cows out for grazing and would bring the cows back in the evening. And therefore, there were some cowgirls also in those days, like you have in America sometimes, and those were called gopis. And he frolicked with them and played with them. But he spent a lot of his time with his young friend, whose name was Udo. And Udo was the same age as a young teenager with uh, Krishna. And one day, Krishna stopped Udo when a ant, a little black ant was crawling on the ground. And he says, 
Udo, have you heard of karma? He says, no, Krishna, I never heard of such a thing as karma. He says, karma is that whatever actions you do, you have to come back to pay for it. That's called karma. That it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Good karma will bring you good results. Bad karma will bring you bad results. Some good will bring you some results. Some bad will bring you some results. But they will not cancel each other and they'll tie you up forever here. He said, look at the sand crawling on the ground. Look at him carefully. And Udo looked at the black ant crawling on the ground. And Krishna says, three times this ant has been Indra, the ruler of one of the heavens. Once he has been Brahma, the creator of this universe, occupying the universal mind as a creator. Today it's an ant because of karma. Very good karma took him to the highest positions of creation, became a creator. And bad karma brought him as an ant. Nothing cancelled each other. He says, Udo, the law of karma is relentless, it's unexplainable. It covers everybody. And therefore, in, in Eastern Punjab, in the land where Krishna was born, I went there once to see how people live in the land where this great avatar this great incarnation of Vishnu God, Vishnu God of sustenance came. And what do they believe in? And they were poor people working in the gardens, in the fields. In the evening, they would have a little smoke and they would drink some kind of a strange kind of concoction that made them roll their heads and sing. So I thought that that must be some kind of a drug they are having that rolls their heads. But what they sang, the refrain of the song they were singing was amazing. All they said again and again was, Are Udo karman ki gat nyari se. He said, Udo, the nature of karma is very strange, unexplainable. He kept on saying that. And that's one of the main songs in the land where Krishna was born. He's talking to Udo about that incident, what karma is. This is a bad enough picture of karma. It's a horrible picture of karma. An American disciple of late master had to point out to me the good side of karma. That karma, good and bad, in combination, is the best thing that could happen to us. Now that's another story altogether. How can good and bad karma, in combination, be the best? That good and bad karma in combination is better than all good karma, is better than all bad karma, and it's the best thing that can happen to a person. Because that was an American disciple, Julian Johnson, who first discovered, much to his surprise, that the events that happen in our life, which are good and which we like, we, we get money, we get a nice living, we get nice kids, we get uh, nice promotions, we get to travel, we do all those good things, those are good karma, and then we get sick, we fall ill, we have accidents, we go into trouble with people, our relationship break, we get disappointments, that's bad karma. That unless you have both, good and bad karma, there is no way you can be a human being. Because if you have all good karma, the other places, heavens, several heavens designed for such people, for such souls and such minds to go and reside there. If you have all bad karma, there are several hells built up in the astral, sub-astral planes where you can go and reside because of all bad karma. You have to have a combination of good and bad, both giving you joys and pleasures at some point and sadness and depression at another point, that you have to have this combination to become human. And only in the human life, one species out of 8.4 billion, <coughs> only one species has the ability <coughs> to go within and open the window inside and escape from the whole system of karma. There is no other escape. How do we escape from this? Because the mind functions and operates as our will. The mind does not merely think on its own. It functions as a will. It, ma it makes you feel that you have many options in life all the time, at every point, and you have to make decisions. 
do you go left or right? Do you join this job or not? Do you eat this food or not? You have to make choices all the time. And therefore, you are expressing your will through your mind. That mind's will, the moment it's expressed within yourself, creates a karma. Therefore, it's inevitable that you will create karma. It's very difficult to believe that there can be a life in which you don't use your mind at all for deciding about things. Therefore, you decide all the time. Therefore, you create karma all the time. Therefore, you come back to pay for it or you get reward for it all the time. This is such a subtle trap. It's far more of a trap than the body or even the world around us. The trap of karma is the greatest trap set up. And then <clears throat> we enjoy this trap. We enjoy, we have free will. Don't be misled by people who say everything has been predetermined. We decide, we even decide whether to accept predetermination or not. We, nobody knows what we are going to decide tomorrow, except ourselves. When somebody can say, tomorrow you will decide this, and you say, no, I don't have to, and you are led to decide exactly the same thing, you wonder how could that person know that you are going to decide like that. And when you, open the window and go inside, you find that the whole of the life and its thinking and the choice making we are doing, the freedom we think we have in the mind is all predetermined, all recorded in advance. That we are watching a movie about ourselves. It's being played out on a multi-dimensional screen outside, which we call this world and our life. Our life is nothing more than a movie being played out on a multi-dimensional screen. And this play that is going on outside contains all the problems. When we watch a movie and we say, hmm, this guy now has to make a big decision. In the movie he has to make a decision. We forget that decision is already made in the next scene. And the scene has been pre-recorded, filmed earlier. But we are carried away with the movie. And we say, let's see what he deci decides now. As if he will decide when we are watching sitting in the theater that he's going to watch. You remember I told the story once about a young man in India who went and saw a movie in which a girl is about to take her clothes off and jump into a pool, but there's a train track in front. And as she tries to take the clothes off, he wants to see what she looks like when she's nude. But the train comes in front. And by the time the train passes, he's already in the water. He misses the scene. He went 20 times to the movie to see one day the train will be late. This is our situation. We are thinking that we are really controlling the events around us, whereas the events are totally predetermined, including the fact that what we will think, what we think we are deciding with our free will, it looks like free will totally predetermined. How do we know this? It's totally predetermined by a very simple step of going within through the window, which lies behind these eyes, inside the body. You go through the window and climb up on the second floor inside. You go to the second floor, you'll find the entire text, the entire script of your life pre-written there. Every page contains all the decisions you ever made and all the decisions you will ever make in the future, thinking you are making those decisions at that time. Just like you think an actor is making a decision on the screen when you're watching it, and saying, now, will he do this or not do this? Because you haven't seen the next scene, you begin to give credit to the fact that he's going to make a decision now. It's pre-filmed. It's already there. The fact that human beings have an experience out of sheer ignorance that they are free will. It's a great thing. If the ignorance were not there, supposing we could all, at any time that we wanted, look at next five minutes of our life, or next 10 minutes, or next day, supposing every one of us could just see what is going to happen. What a terrible, bored, boring life it will be, that we are, have no control over anything. We are just going through a script. It's like a play. We are acting on a play and we have no real life at all. It's terrible. 
just the ignorance of what is going to happen is making life so interesting, making life so real, making our free will so real, making us believe that the mind is a reality and has the same power that any free person could ever have. So the mind, by acting in a certain way, works on a script which is part of the karmic pattern and therefore karma is not only a very relentless, terrible prison for us. It's a prison which we seem to enjoy after a while because we say we are, we are making decisions, we are free to do what we like. We should not be allowed, our mind should not be allowed to be influenced by anybody. We'll work on our own. We say all those things. And then we go and read in the Akashic records where we picked up a script that all that thought was written, pre-written already to make it real. It's a good question. Why has, it been, how, why has it been designed like this? If the purpose of life is to just find a window and escape from it, why, I got in, why we got into it in the first place? Who decided that we should get into this series of prisons? Did somebody force us into these prisons? Was there a separate God? Was there some devil? Somebody who pushed us into all these prisons? And we are now situated where we are. Who did it? How do we discover who did it? We have to find a script writer. Who wrote those scripts in the Akashic records, in Turiyapal, in the causal stage, where we can go and see them? We can see all the scripts ever written. We can see all the combinations and permutations of different lives, human lives, and all other kinds of lives that can ever happen. Who wrote them? There's some script writer, some author of these, who's hiding behind those. We try very hard. You can explore the whole of the causal plane, which is much vaster than the astral plane, which it see indeed is much vaster than the entire physical creation. You can explore the whole of it at not speed of light, at the speed of mind, which is instantaneous speed to go anywhere you like. Even at that speed, you can search the whole of the causal plane, you will never find who the script writer is. And yet, we are all bound by those scripts. But we, we are curious to find out that we are trapped in a prison and somebody must have written all the script that we are being forced to go through our karma here. And we think that we created our own karma. We are being punished and rewarded for something that somebody wrote a script and put us through it. Very unfair. And the unfairness of it makes us curious to find out who we are. Then comes a bigger door. The window behind the eyes has been called the tenth door. The window to go beyond the physical universe, beyond the physical experiences, has been called the tenth door just to distinguish it between the nine doors, the nine apertures, which are on our body outside. To eyes, to ear, to nose, mouth, and to lower apertures. These nine doors that open outside, the tenth door opens inside. And the inner window is called the tenth door. When you go to the top of Trikuti, if you read the literature, Santamat literature of the mystics, say Radhaswami mystics, you see their literature, they talk of a tenth door behind the eyes, then they talk of Daswandwar, tenth door, above the mind, above the causal plane. Pargram has been called the tenth door also. It's amazing that the word tenth door has been called not only here to escape from the physical prison, but to escape from the whole prison of the mind. There's another tenth door that lies in Pargram beyond the mind. And when you open that, that's the only way to find out who the author of the script is, who wrote the script. And there you discover that the script was written by your own consciousness. The creative power that makes everything alive, including yourself, including the whole universe. And then you say, how could I have done that? How could I have done that when so many others were there also to do it? Why did I take the responsibility? So the journey is not over. The spiritual journey goes beyond that, but you say, I want to understand 
that if I am consciousness, the creator of all conscious experiences, the creator of all universes, the creator of all that has ever happened, if I am the cause of all that, what about the others like me? What about other souls who are all units of consciousness like me? What about them? And then you have to move one step higher. That step is the most difficult step. It's called the step of going through a darkness which whirls and turns you back again and again. It's an amazing, it's, a, it's an amazing whirling darkness. That means a darkness through which you want to walk. Supposing you have a dark room to cross, a large dark room, and you find that you have to go from one door to another door to go over a cross. And you go and you say, now I've reached the other door. And as you reach the other door, you open, you back in the first door. That you never went. The darkness itself turned you around and turned you around several times. So you never know which side you're going. Every time you want to open the other door, you go back to the first door. This is just about the state when you discover you are a soul, the mind has been left behind, karma has been left behind, all the prisons have been left behind, you are free, and still you are being turned back by your blackness, darkness there. How can that be? And then you discover that there is such a big whirlwind of darkness. The darkness is bigger than the entire creation of all the three regions. It's so huge. Therefore, through that darkness, they say, no soul, no individuated soul has ever passed without the help of another soul which is already tied up with the universal soul above it and remains tied up with that universal total soul, total consciousness. Only total consciousness can pull you out from your individuated consciousness through the darkness. So it's been in the literature called Bhavar Gufa. Bhavar Gufa means the whirling cave. They call it the whirling cave. It swirls around and therefore you enter the cave to go to the other side, you come out from the same side. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you go into that cave, you can spend eons, you can spend millions and billions of years of physical time, and you still come out from the same side. It's an amazing experience sitting there, and only somebody, some soul, which has already crossed that, crossed that great darkness, with the help of another soul which was tied to the totality out beyond that. The total pulled that little individuated inside. That's the only way to cross it. That has also been called the crossing of the tenth door into the power Gufa, the swirling cave. And then that power can pull you out, which itself is on the other side. Indeed, who's that power? Do you know who that power is that can pull you through that swirling hole? It's the power of a perfect living master sitting in, a, in our midst in a physical body here. Because when a perfect living master is sitting in a physical body here, his consciousness is not only attached to the astral plane, where he's working at the same time with many other disciples of his. He's not only sitting in the causal plane, where some souls have been sitting for millions of years with the same master. He's not only operating in the power drum beyond the mind, at the same time when he's sitting with us as a human being. He's not only operating, he's operating at the same time in the fifth region of such kind, the totality of consciousness, and he never leaves hold of that. Therefore, since he's not left hold of it, he is still the totality of consciousness, even when he's sitting here, and he can pull us through the swirling cave, the Bhavar Gufa. What an amazing arrangement. How can we ever judge? How can we ever know the power, the reality of a perfect living master? An ordinary person who lives like us, dresses like us, eats like us, sure, 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 like us. Shit, shave and shower. And then, on top of that, he falls sick like us, and in his body dies like us. What else can you imagine? A person who is absolutely like us should be at the same time, while he's a person like that, holding this kind of consciousness that he's aware at all times, not only of all the regions of consciousness, 
for the totality of consciousness, which can pull you through a Bhava Kupa. The spiritual path of perfect living masters does not end anywhere less than such khand, our true home, our true reality, our true totality. It's only when we reach true totality we discover who the script writer was. That was not only the script writer of one particular life, the script writer of the entire creation. Script writer for the whole of this creation, for an adventure of consciousness, for an exploration of the power of consciousness. That consciousness can be conscious of anything it wants to, of any power it wants to, of any scenario it wants to, of any universe it wants to. That the consciousness is continuously experimenting. By creating time, it can create universes like this one. By creating no time, it can create different, different kind of universes with no time. It can create universes like this physical universe with gravity as a great power. It has created several universes with no gravity and other forces as its main power. That consciousness, how does it create? What's the great secret about consciousness creating? such big universes, such great life, such interesting activity, such interesting life forms, and then karma and karmic patterns. What is the modus operandi? How can consciousness set up all this? When you reach there, it's the simplest of tasks. What is consciousness? Consciousness is the power to be conscious. Conscious of what? Of anything. It only has to be conscious it becomes creation. When consciousness says, I'm conscious of this universe, the universe comes into being. And who observes the universe? Who experiences? Consciousness. And it wants to experience the universe from a different angle, becomes a soul, becomes a point of view, or different place in different places. It wants to explore a different kind of reality. It puts on a mind and creates time and space through the mind consciousness creates. It wants to explore more it makes the reality by creating a law of karma under the mind. It wants to have fun, it says, let's have fun. And he sets up universes like the one we are sitting on and planets like this. If consciousness intention was to have fun, are we having fun? I thought we were supposed to have fun. Just by this little recital, by little recital of how we have come into being, just by recital of creation took place, we found out we are the script writers in our own totality. And we have become individuated. And we have become accompanied with powers like the mind and the senses and the body to have, to have fun. Why aren't we having fun? What went wrong? We came for fun. There's no question about it. No consciousness would ever think of it. Uh, we are all conscious beings because we have part of the consciousness. Where are we? Did we move away from consciousness? No, we are still there. Somebody asked me this question in 1962 in a church. They said, if you say that we have left our home and have to go back through a mystic way to go back home, why did we leave it? And my answer surprised them. I said, we never left it. We just thought we left it. We just Imagine we left it. We never left a home. The spiritual path is not going anywhere. The spiritual path is to recover your own consciousness, who you are. It's a travel through layers of consciousness. It's a travel through layers of awareness to discover who you really are. Peeling off the external and finding out internally that you are always there, that you never left. It's like a person going to sleep at night and the dream is traveling far away. And then he wakes up and found the whole dream took place right in his bed. He moved nowhere. The dream sequence was an experience of going somewhere. It is not real. If you have a horrible dream and no fun at all, nightmare, and you are shaking and crying, what kind of nightmare? And then you wake up, thank God it was just a dream. <laughs> Won't we say that after this experience? So we have not lost the fun, only we have postponed the fun. We have postponed it to the time when we wake up. Just like 
if we have lost our fun in a dream, when we wake up, it's very funny what kind of dream we have. The very horrible dream becomes funny because it was not real. We woke up. Do you realize that the levels of consciousness we are talking about into which we awake, level by level, stage by stage, we go through those levels. Each one is like a wakefulness. Each one awakes us to our reality and what we thought was real becomes a dream. This is a dream. It looks like real because we are not awake. We wake up, this becomes a dream and we laugh at it. The next one which looks real, we wake up, becomes a dream. Then we say, now we have come to reality where the whole creation is taking place from. And we wake up, that becomes a dream. Then we say, no, we have to go beyond. And the soul is the reality. We have to go to the power Brahm, beyond mind and go there. And we enjoy that we have found out who we are. It's just a dream. We wake up again, another dream. Then we find, we wake up into consciousness. The whole sequence of events was all dreams, one after the other. Therefore, how do you feel when you wake up? You feel that was some strange fund which we set up. That were strange triggers that we built into the system so that we could have some excitement and fun. And one of the experiments consciousness has tried very successfully is to try to create an experience by the principle of duality. That means by creating opposites. That's worked out very well for consciousness. That if you create something in pairs, that means you create an electron, a proton, negative, positive. You create light and darkness. You create life and death. If you create everything in pairs, you are bound to experience them. If you don't create in pairs, you won't experience them. Very simple. That if you want to create a universe that is lying within, the realm of physical experience, that is lying within the realm of astral experience or within the realm of causal experience, it has to be in pairs, otherwise you won't experience it. An, an experience which has no opposite cannot be experienced in the three worlds of the mind, senses and the physical body. The physical body only experiences what the opposite of it can also be experienced. Great principle. And the principle has been applied very well. Except that when we applied the principle to pleasure and pain, we said to have pleasure, you must have pain, otherwise how will you know you are having pleasure? When you have pain, then you say, oh, this is painful. The other is pleasurable. You distinguish it. But because of another big barrier, another one big wall of the prison called time, we experience these pain and pleasure both in time. We can have pleasure for five minutes and we can have pain for five minutes. But when we have pleasure for five minutes, it looks to us like one minute. And when we have pain for five minutes, it looks to us to be 15 minutes. Therefore, although we created all things in equal balance, we created all the opposites in exactly equal balance. Our experience changed. Our experience changed because those experiences were placed in time. And in time, our experience was not the same for what we considered as pleasurable and what we considered as painful. So we had a problem that we actually began to feel more pain than pleasure, although both were equal. Also, we applied the principle of duality the principle of pairs of opposites in some more subtle ways. The most subtle way was that in order to create the pairs of opposites, there has to be a state of being which is not in the pairs of opposites. Otherwise, how will you experience opposites? So you had to retain a life form, an experience of the soul in Parvram and Satchikhand above the mind which has no opposites in order to make this experience of pairs of opposites the opposite of that. Not only it helped to make this world and this universe a world of pairs of opposites and duality, 
it made the real world of no duality into a duality of this world. We could not have even experienced Saj Khan if we didn't have this. What an amazing situation. What does consciousness really need? Consciousness needed this. Consciousness needed that even with no duality at all, we have to create a world of dualities in order to experience that we are living in a world of no duality. Otherwise, it wouldn't be experienced. Look at the inevitability we created in this creation. It's inevitable that each part of it must exist for the rest to be sustained. So that is amazing that we set up like this. How can we have fun at every level of this creation, which was the design? We should be able to have fun and enjoy that we created pairs of opposites. We should be able to have fun that there is something less shackled than the physical world, than the physical body, that there are freedoms available to us, free to fly, free to go to galaxies, free to go anywhere in the created universe. Not that we are strapped here, we can't go to another planet even over here. We can't even go to another star from here. And we so, so much uh, restricted. This is a very big restriction on us. And here just by releasing ourselves from this body, we can have that experience. Maybe we can wait for death, pray. Okay, when we die, we hope we'll be free. Some people wait for that. Some say, but supposing it is even worse, supposing we go to hell, then what happens? So they are afraid. Now because the hope and fear are also opposites. We hope for good things and we fear bad things. Since fear is like pain and hope is like a reward like pleasure when we have equal hope and equal fear fear overwhelms us and hope disappears hope becomes one ten and fear becomes ten times more and therefore we are afraid of death it's amazing that death which can be seen as an equal liberator a death that can liberate us from this shackle and maybe take us freedom flying with our souls anywhere or the fear we can go to hell in this combination, we are more afraid just because of the time factor. Time has been caused the most subtle negative thing that ever was created. And yet time is the only thing that is making us have all the joys and pleasures and fun of this world. Amazing that the most seductive thing created, the one on which all the pleasures have been laid out, on which all the pains have been laid out, on which all lives have been laid out, should be the greatest trap for us. That's time. Time has been called the creator of all negativity. Time in, uh, in literal Hindi or Sanskrit translation is Kal. Kal means time. Kal has been called the negative power that's governing the whole thing. Whatever has been created in Kal, whatever has been created by Kal, whatever has been created by the negative power of time, that's the, created all the traps for us over here. It's more subtle than even the trap of the karma. Mm -hmm. It's more subtle than any trap. To be able to transcend time, there is no way to transcend time. Because even in the state above the mind, and we know time has been created by the mind, and universal mind has created time, even when you go beyond that, there's a remnant of this time which is very difficult to explain, but I still want to tell you, it's called timeless time. That means that all time is shrunk into zero, but still exists, still there. Can you imagine in mathematics, we write zero plus minus zero. Do you know the difference between minus zero and plus zero? Zero is nothing. Then what is minus zero? And what is plus zero? In mathematics, Minus zero, if you move from there, we'll go into minus one. Plus zero, if you move from there, we'll go to plus one. It gets zero. The zero is hiding in it, the possibility of minus one and plus one. The zero time, the timeless time in Parbrahm is holding the capacity of generating time both ways. And therefore, it's still a kind of time which the mind can never understand. The mind cannot understand that even in zero time, there is still time. But beyond Parvara, through what is called the 
cave, the Bhavan Gufa, which itself is so timeless because you can be bound there forever and never know where to go. There are souls trapped there forever. No escape. And they were able to reach there because of the help of perfect living masters who went to Parbrahm and we call them in Indian tradition Sad Gurus instead of Sat Gurus. The two terms are used S A D G U R and S A T. Sat Guru means the, the Guru of Truth. Sad Guru means the Guru who has reached the highest state of discovering his soul. The highest state of discovering your soul is Parbrahm. When you go on about the mind, then you know what your soul is like. It's a light, it's full of light, it's full of knowledge, it's full of everything. It doesn't have any time of this kind. It's in a timeless time. So the sadhgurus who have taken us up to that state, their disciples, when they have tried to cross, including with their sadhgurus, are trapped in the Bhavar Gufa forever. It's very, I get pity. If you go through the Bhavar Gufa, you'll find there's a bigger population there trapped than in the entire creation here. Such a big prison here. And yet they are free from the mind. They are free from all the, all the trap that we are talking of here. So unless there is a Satguru, that means one who is continuously attached to such con to the totality of consciousness in awareness at all times, there is no way to go through that. So that's why time is generated at that stage and therefore some describers of this different levels of consciousness and this hierarchy of consciousness have described the Bhavar Gufa as lower than even Parbrahm, though it's beyond Parbrahm. So when you draw a map, a physical map of the spiritual path, you say here we are at the physical plane, there we are going to higher the astral plane, there we go on higher up and we keep on drawing and we reach Parbrahm. It's like a hilltop. We discovered who we were. And then we have the oh, huge cave, that's below that. Then we go up and we see such a It's drawn like that. that. Now, one of the reasons why it is said is because such khand, now I'm talking in terms of time and space because there's no other way to describe it. It's a story. I'm making a story. Not only I made the story, great master made the same story. Sar Bachchan made the same story. Swamiji of Radha Swami made the same story. I'm repeating a story because I know and you should know it cannot be explained. We're talking of timeless and spaceless states and then we're talking of these big things. So obviously there is some little amount of error in that. The error being that you cannot imagine with the mind at state. But the top of Parvam is indeed individuated soul, but it is really part of the galaxy, the, the collection of islands of consciousness of such kind. Now some of these things you may not ordinarily hear. They are only written in the secret book of Manual for Masters. <laughs> <laughs> so some, sometimes great master would let me peep into some of the manuals so I can tell you that such kind, which we say uh, is, a, is a totality of consciousness, if you were to describe it in physical terms, on earth terms, it's like a huge, huge mainland surrounded by islands. And each island belongs to one individuated soul. And the intervening ocean is also souls. It's all consciousness. And those that have experienced, those that have experienced other realities, like the physical reality, and are back through their perfect living masters into that region, are called Buns. Those who have never left that, the soul, the consciousness that has been swimming there, which is much larger in size than the portion of the consciousness that came and had these experiences, that is called Hans. So the Hans souls and the Buns souls intermingle there. But each soul has one Dweep. Dweep means an island, a lighted island, that each one has an island of light in that big ocean. And the soul that has an island, those islands are permanent. They are part of such khand. 
They are part of the true home. That's their home. That means you can simultaneously experience individuation and totality. It's a great experience that any time, any soul in such kind can experience individuation and can experience totality. And sometimes you can experience in the same time because there is no time. Okay? Now that's a wonderful experience there. But out of all the dweeps that are in such hand, one of the dweeps is Bhagavad Therefore, when the ultimate final destruction takes place of the entire universe, and nothing remains except such kind, the top of Paragram, Paragram remains as part of such kind. The lower part of Paragram disappears. So Paragram is two parts. The timeless time is in the lower part of Paragram. And the timelessness, absolutely, there is no time, is in the upper part of, which is part of such kind. Therefore, Giving a physical example that you are going on a journey upwards on the hills, on the mountains. You go after one peak after another, go higher and higher. And you go on to the highest peak. There you can see Mount Everest from there. Because that was the second highest peak you went to. Then you can take a dip into the whirling cave and you don't see either of the two. You don't see where Parabram is gone. You don't see where such kind is. You are lost. You're lost to the valley. Then you rise again. And when you go back on the second highest peak, you can see the other peak also. And so therefore, it is likened, it is one of the dweeps. So therefore, it's as permanent as such kant. But it only allows you to experience individuated consciousness, which means a soul, and not total consciousness, which means Satpurish, the creator of all the universe the creator of everything. Now, <clears throat> for a long time, the mystics, even perfect living mystics, had told people about these secrets. They told people that, look, all the yogis, yogeshwars who are taking you, they're taking you on intermediate stages. Most of the yogis, because yoga was considered to be the real secret of union, Yoga means reunion, literally. Sanskrit word yoga means union. Union between your separated self and your totality. That was union. The union was practiced through the mind. And the mind by various practices led to Trikuti, the second stage, causal stage, where you experience the universal mind from which the original mind has been created in the same way like the soul has been created from totality of consciousness. Same process, mind has followed, is a great copycat of the original process of creation. Anurag Sagar by Kabir describes this process very well, how the mind copied everything that was in reality. So the mind, universal mind, gives the same experience to the mind, and therefore if we, are, if we think we are the mind, to the soul, that you have reached the final, there's nothing beyond that. So therefore, the yogis who practiced the highest yoga available went up to the Trikuti Yoga, the three worlds, the top of the three worlds, the top of three mountains. They were named the mountains there to show the beginning, middle and end, that all things have to have a beginning, middle and end. And therefore, gods must be divided into three. One creator has to be divided into three. In Trikuti, there are three gods. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, creator, maintainer, destroyer. You have to have three, otherwise how do you run the universe of time? So, therefore the yogis, even the highest yogis, who wanted to practice the yoga of union with universality, with the universal mind, with the totality, because they were working through the mind, they only went to Trikuti and thought that was union with their entire totality. The soul remained submerged in the mind and was still subject to rebirth. And this has been pointed out even by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. When he talks to, to Arjun, the prince, he says, Prince, even people who have reached the totality of the mind are still subject to the law of karma. You have to go by another yoga, the yoga of bhakti yoga, which alone can take you beyond that state. Bhakti yoga is the yoga of love and devotion. Because he said, love and devotion arise from a point higher than this. 
they arise higher from the mind. That the mind is not responsible for the origin of love and devotion. It has to come from a higher point, therefore, from the soul. So therefore, the yogis got stuck. Even the highest yogis got stuck. And then, some of them never went there even. They reached astral planes, they saw heavens, Bekunt, they saw some different kind of beautiful places they examined and wrote about it. They talked to God sitting there and creating it. So most of the religions of the world today, indeed all the religions that I have studied, are calling the ruler of the astral stage as God, as Allah, as Ishwar, Parmeshwar, as the creator of the universe. They are calling the God of the very first stage above the physical universe as the God of the entire creation. Because they can go no further. Nobody ever told them that anything further. It looks final. In the astral plane, everything can be created similar to what lies above. You can create such khand there and say, this is such khand. It's all in time and space. It's all like us looking here. And we therefore say, we read the books. It looks like that. Therefore, this is the final. And therefore, we have been worshipping God in any form, with any name directing it only to the creator and ruler who is a soul like us by good karma has become the ruler of that area and ruler of this universe so that is why the religion went far away from even the yogis and the yogis then distinguish themselves that this is yogi he only goes up to some point this is a yogeshwar this is a maha yogeshwar so they introduce new titles to show one who could go beyond the astral plane. In due course of time, many other yogis came and wrote their treatises and texts about yoga. Patanjali came, he says, oh, old yoga was very difficult to achieve, it's so difficult to pull your attention in. Therefore, it's better to do some kind of physical movements of the body, do some things, and he prescribed certain kinds of peace-giving, calm, that give you mind, mental calm by lying in different postures. Lie like a dead body. Shavasana, lie, lie like a bird inverted, another asana. And he recorded 84 asanas to correspond with the 84 uh, lakhs, which is 8.4 million of different species. He said, you just follow different forms of species and behave like them with your body and you get peace in mind because your mind will be diverted to these asanas, these postures, and therefore you will be union, have union. Ultimately, yoga became merely an exercise of the bodies, which the earlier yogis and yogeshwars were using the same exercises because they practice their meditation, their yoga, their sadhana, their practice in little caves. In the cave, they couldn't do jogging to keep the body fit. So they introduced the kinds of movements of the body within a small space, that within a cave you can move your body and get all the muscles exercised. Original purpose was that. We came out of the cave and began to think just those body movements in different forms are yoga. Then we come to foreign countries, yoga travel to the West, and books on yoga are written. And they're all about different postures. And yoga centers have opened up around the world, teaching you how to keep your bodies in different positions. Well, what happened to the union with your totality? What happened to going to such Khan? We got so far removed from that. And therefore, new kind of tribes of yogis came up. And then, these perfect living masters came in the midst of these yogis. And they wanted to tell them, look, you are trapped. What are you teaching people? You're teaching about the body. And even when you do sadhana, when you do meditation, you're telling them to go into areas of the body which are functioning to sustain the body alive. The six centers of energy in the body, which are sustaining the body. The six chakras, you made them into spiritual centers. And just because the reflection of the six chakras is taking place from another six chakras. And those are being governed by who you name as gods. That you name them as 
Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva and all that. Therefore you are given the same names to these organs of the body, these different positions of the body and you call them the chakras of energy and you say that spirituality. You call your yoga into spirituality. Don't you see? You are misleading people. Don't you see a man who is awake with his eyes open and he is according to you at the sixth chakra already sitting here. You are telling him close your eyes, take deep breath, take your attention down into the breathing apparatus, go into the throat and to the lungs, then go further down, then go right to the bottom on your butts and then work your way hard from chakra to chakra and come back. Where? To the eyes. That's where the knowledge is. Did you know where you started from? A wakeful man started from there. You want to put him down into the lowest level and then say, this is yoga that you bring back and you say, oh, I found myself. You're finding yourself before you went into this meditation. Yogis, don't teach them these things. These were meant for exercising the body. These were meant for regulating your energies. These were meant for eating good food. These were meant for seeing what is good for each, for regulating your sex. They were meant for regulating your diet, meant for regulating your breathing. They were meant for physical activities to keep you fit so that you can meditate. And you made that into an exercise for God realization. And you call all this yoga into God realization. This is nothing of the sort. So the yogis had gone down to that level and the masters came and picked them up and said no. They said, do you have a different yoga? We learned this yoga from Patanjali. We learned this yoga from so many Bikram yoga, so many yogas. We heard 20 kinds of yogas, which is your yoga. The master said, we also have a yoga. Our yoga is called Surt Shabd Yoga. The yoga of putting your attention on the sound. That looks very funny. How can we like music? We like music, we like to chant, we like to play different musical instruments and we like to put our attention on the sound. They said, no. Surt Shabd Yoga is not listening to any music. It's listening to music beyond the 10th door within. Unless you can listen to the 10th door within, you are not practicing Surt Shabd Yoga. As yet they call it yoga. You are true yoga. You want true yoga for the modern time, in Iron Age, in Kalyu, the best yoga you can ever find and will take you to the highest place which we call such kind of <coughs> Yabd Yoga. They said, how do you make that claim? What is so special about this new yoga you have come out with? This yoga of the attention and the sound. They explained that consciousness, life, the very creative power that is making us alive, that's making our souls alive, that's making our mind alive, that power <coughs> is expressing itself in a strange kind of vibratory form, in a strange kind of form which to us can look like sound. We are not saying it's the same sound as you make with a musical instrument. All musical instruments you can make them very melodious, but you cannot create a melody that is so sweet and soft that comes resonating without any harshness at all. And that resonance, that sweet melody is coming not from anywhere outside, mm. it's coming from your own consciousness. It's not coming from your mind, it's not coming from any part of your body, it's coming from your own consciousness. Your attention is flowing from the same consciousness from which the music is flowing. Therefore, if you can turn your attention to its own origin, if you can turn your attention to listen to a music that's coming from the very place where the attention is coming from, don't you think you'll discover yourself? There's another beauty of this sound of consciousness. The beauty is that whereas our spectacular vision of creation changes with the level of creation, which means we go to sleep, it's another world. We wake up, new wakeful world comes up. We go to the astral plane, new world comes up. We go to causal plane, another world. The spectacle changes. 
music never changes. Music remains connected. That sound of consciousness cannot break because if it breaks, all the experience will be destroyed. We'll neither be here nor there because the music has stopped. So music never stops. If it is connected with totality of consciousness, with such heart, then that music can never stop. Therefore, it's a connection, not only between here and the ultimate goal, it's a connection with every level of consciousness. Therefore, the easiest way, the best way, the royal way, Kamino Riyal, is to attach yourself to the sound, because the sound can come from nowhere except your own totality. Why worry about different kinds of meditation and yoga and all that and try this different stunts to control your mind and so on? It's very difficult to control the mind. One mystic was so brazen enough in India, he said, if somebody comes and tells me I have made a bridge on the whole ocean, I think it's impossible to make it, but I'll believe it for a moment. Maybe somebody can do it. If somebody came, the fish came and swallowed the whole ocean water, it's impossible. For a moment, I'll believe that. But if a person comes and says, I've controlled my mind, I won't believe that. <laughs> he said, controlling the mind is very, very difficult. So why waste your time in trying to control something that nobody has ever controlled? Therefore, use a simpler method. Forget about the mind. Don't worry about controlling it. Attach yourself to the sound current, to the sound coming from your own totality. And hold on to it. Use your attention. Instead of scattering your attention in all the other things that are created around you for fun, and which your thinking is painful and is all terrible, withdraw from there and put your attention on the sound which is ringing in everybody. There's no human being without it. Human beings have been given this special facility of having the best maneuverable attention. That they can put their attention wherever they like. They can put an attention on a book. They can put an attention on music. They can put an attention on a thought. They can put an attention on an abstract thing. This maneuverability doesn't exist anywhere else. So use this beautiful, wonderful opportunity to put your attention on the sound. And the sound will be so unlike any other sound because it's so melodious. It's got a melody of its own. It's got a softness that you cannot find in any sound outside. And the softness of the sound will attract you. And then the sound will become louder because you are being pulled toward the sound, which will be you are being pulled to your own self. When you are pulled to your own self, the sound will become louder and louder and better and will have an attraction. And you suddenly feel this sound is no sound. It has its personality that's attracting me. A very great experience. Can you ever imagine that within all of us a sound exists which when you listen to it, you feel this sound is a living thing. Why do you have that feeling? Because when you find a, an ordinary person outside whom we call a perfect living master, he is not representing a perfect living man outside, he is representing the perfect sound inside. If you will find that the master is always a manifestation of that sound. Isn't that amazing? So when you go and attach yourself to the sound, the spectacle that comes up after practice and experience is that what you thought was sound also has light in it, also has a radiance in it, and in the radiance, in the same sound, in the same radiance, you see the image of the same man you called an ordinary effective master in a physical body. What an experience. Then you discover that these perfect living masters, they come in ordinary form, like ordinary bodies with us, to be friends with us, to draw us towards a path of love and devotion, and they act in a certain way, so that we fall in love with them. And therefore, they pull us with their love and draw us to the inside form of theirs. We recognize their form because we see them outside. And then later on we realize they are representing the whole stream of consciousness coming from such kind from our true home. We attach ourselves to them even more outside.
because we see who they really are. Till then we didn't know. Till we see this radiant form of the same master inside ourselves, we do not realize who a master is. No matter how hard we try. We say, this is a good guy, he is very knowledgeable, he can give answers, he can do that. He must have got some journey, maybe he is in such kind, maybe somewhere, we don't know anything about it. But once you see the radiant form of the master emanating from the sound and the light within yourself, you know exactly who he is. And with practice, it doesn't happen overnight, I must tell you. You can have one glimpse overnight that sets your faith, faith in this. But then the glimpses keep on changing. But with practice, you come to a point when just by closing your eyes, you can see that same thing. Or without closing your eyes, you can see the same thing. And you are never alone after that. Nobody who has ever had that experience has ever complained of loneliness. Whereas I go around the world today, everybody is complaining of loneliness. So the solution is there. For all loneliness, find the true companion inside yourself. You'll never be lonely again. So that is great because all the adventure of creation at all levels no longer becomes a solitary adventure of your soul running around everywhere trying to see what is there. It becomes a journey in companionship, a friendship of which there is no other. Can't even improve upon it. I can't see how you can make this whole system better. Therefore, the mystics say the practice of the sound current, the yoga of surt, shabd yoga, the yoga of attaching your surt, your attention to the shabd, to the sound, is the highest form of shabd yoga that we know of. If anybody can find something higher, tell us. We will adopt it. But we have found nothing better than that. Therefore, we recommend, if you want to be a yogi, and you are trying to practice yoga, okay, practice this one. If you have tried other yogas, try this one too, and see where it leads you. So that's why these perfect living masters, coming in ordinary simple bodies like us, living human lives like us, carrying all the consciousness and totality within themselves, carrying the awareness of that at all times, not that they have to close their eyes and go somewhere. When they are talking to us, looking at us, they are looking from the entire hierarchy of, of consciousness. All the levels of consciousness are available to them. They have to act completely human like us, so that we befriend them. If they act differently, we are no longer physical friends, and we cannot have that experience of love and devotion we would like to have, because somehow, in this world, in this creation, it appears that love is only really possible between two human beings. It's rare, but it's possible between human beings. But it's very easy to have attachment between human beings, between pets, between houses, between cars. You can be attached to anything. Attachment is easy because attachment remains an experience of separation. Attachment remains I and that, I and you. It never changes. Whenever you have an attachment, you feel, that's me, that's who I love. I love my house, I love you, I love my car, I love my pet, I love my dog, I love my wife, I love my children, I love all these people. I have all attachments. Because the I is more prominent than you or the things. I comes first. And everything else comes next. They're all attachments. But true love is where you forget the I. The beloved occupies you so much in your thoughts, in your mind. You can't think of yourself at all. That's true love. True love puts the beloved in your place and pushes the I back. You can't even think of the I. It is possible. It happens. Indeed, it happens to all of us at some time or the other. Because the soul is naturally of, in love. Soul is made of love. Therefore, the spiritual activity in us automatically leads to love. But our mind comes in the way and we start thinking about what is happening. And doubts come, fear comes, they no longer love. And then we are left with attachments. So that is why 
although the possibility was there that we could love everybody. You will notice these perfect living masters when they come. Have you ever noticed carefully what their love is like? <clears throat> are they attached or are they in love? You should watch carefully. And you see that when they are with a disciple, the disciple occupies the whole of their consciousness, not themselves. They push their own eye behind. They don't eye, eye in their love for us. So that's why you can see an example. There is no better example than in the love that we can experience from a perfect living master. It's so different. That's love. We all can have it. We all have it in us. Our spirituality calls for pure love. Our mind calls for attachments. So long as we think we are the mind, we are attached. When we become spiritual, love flows through us. So I have taken a lot of your time today. <laughs> I hope you don't mind because I was in a rambling state, rambled through all, right? And I hope you, I didn't catch any one of you in the whirling cave, Baba and Gufa. And uh, so, uh, we are lucky, those of us who have found a perfect living master. I cannot, I cannot think of greater luck that can befall to a human being. I cannot think with all my 84 years of life, with all my experience with hundreds of masters around the world, with all these experiences, I cannot find anything better, anything more fortunate than discovering, being discovered by a perfect living master and getting initiated by that master. I don't know anything better than that in this universe. If any one of you or anyone else in the universe has something better than this, I'll take it any day. Nobody has been able to answer that, <coughs> give me suggestions the last 84 years. I'll be 85 in November. I'm still waiting. So therefore, I congratulate you. Many of you are initiated. And many of you are seekers who are bound to be initiated. Therefore, the secret is seeking again. You seek in your heart, nowhere. You don't have to shout for anything. Don't have to go anywhere. Don't have to travel to any holy places. Don't have to travel to any works of temples and churches which are made by us. Look into the temple that's made by God himself, which is our own body. Our own body is the temple of God, the God made. And God himself resides in this temple. He resides nowhere else. It does occur to me, people are praying like this, looking up. Where are they looking? Is God hiding in the sky? Is he? I saw that movie called The Invention of Lying. A man invented a lie for the first time in a village, there was no lying. And he invented a lie that there's a man in the sky who runs the whole universe. And because he was so much into the man in the sky, the girl whom he loved was going to marry somebody else. Then he had to confess that he was telling a lie. He all made up, there's no man in the sky at all. God is in, in your heart, God is inside your mind, God is inside your head, God is inside your consciousness. There's nowhere outside. Therefore, if you want to find God, you have to go within. Nothing outside. Outside all a projection of experiences. Outside is merely a created world, a temporary created world. For you, each one of you, each one of us, it will disappear when we die. This world we think is permanent, wait till you die. It just shrinks away like that. And there's no more world of this guy. So what are we talking about? Looking for God somewhere else, outside in this temporary world? One who is permanent, immortal? We are looking for an immortal little creation. He lies in consciousness which is immortal and lies inside us. His body dies, we don't die. And God dies, lives inside that which never dies. So therefore, the whole truth is to go with him. We'll have a break. I noticed that uh, some people are very hungry. <laughs> well, that's also part of life, you know. Sometimes we do say to each other, what a life, right? What a life. We have to eat, drink, do all these things just to survive. Thank you very much for the patience. <laughs>